I thought I'd just start off by running Ninja Pizza Girl. Is that the max this thing goes to? Oh, hit play, doesn't matter. Not because Ninja Pizza Girl is an amazing piece of anything. Oh, it's windowed. Oh, awesome. Didn't click the full screen button. But just to sort of prove that I done code before I start talking about uh, all the things I've learned, I might as well show you some of the end results. Look at this. She can jump and she can go left or right. And it's amazing. I'll talk a little bit about the character controller. Nicole, my wife, is dedicated to making my life difficult. Look at that. It's a bendy platform and she interacts with it. And one of the, when I started off, we said, oh, we'll do a 2D platformer because uh, character controllers, uh, that sounds really easy. And <laughs> it's, it's not really easy. The whole time I've been wanting to pick through Ty's code base to see how all these things I took for granted were done. <laughs> Unity ships with a character controller. Ugh. As, Stuff. Yeah, well, you think it's easy. It's a 2D character controller. They've been doing it since Mario, the first Super Mario Brothers. That's ancient. It must be easy. It must be super simple. And it's not. And trying to come up with a good solution uh, to handle something that we take for granted it was, was quite challenging for me. Nicole decided to make my life harder. Uh, you see that little thing there? That doesn't look very impressive. I, I bet you are not impressed at all by her ability to walk over that smoothly. No, no, no one's impressed by that. That's really hard. That's really hard. If I was using Unity's character controller, she would be going pop, pop, pop over each one. But she just smoothly blends over that. Isn't that great? And I had to do that because Nicole wanted a game that was rough and wasn't because I said, hey, let's do side scroller. Let's do like Super Mario Brothers where everything's right angles and that'll make my life slightly easier. And she goes, no, because that looks like shit. And it's got to be interesting and arty. And so we've already formed a proper coder artist relationship. <laughs> and the other thing, we, oh, failed. I'm going to have to run there again. Oh, no, it just rebooted me. That's good. That's clever. I did that. Um, the other thing that we wanted was we wanted it to be a very physical world. So I go, well, that's fine. I'll just do a character controller that integrates with the physics system. That'll be easy. I'm not a coder. And I'm not a big-brained person. Uh, I did a bit of reading about collision detection techniques. I still don't know how to resolve a collision. Like, you know, when you detect it, you've got like some shape and you detect, oh, it hit this, it hit that, and hit this. I've got no idea where to put it afterwards. The two people who know what I'm talking about think that's very funny. Uh, uh, writing a collision system was beyond me, so I cheated. Uh, so what we're looking at here... That's what uh, game does all about, isn't it? Pretty much. It's just a series of, of cheats. So there you go. She, everything sort of moves and reacts and she can get to bits. Oh, that's already fallen down. Uh, she's a rigid body. But she's not just a rigid body because if she was just a rigid body, uh, well, she'd be a pain in the butt for starters. There we go. Look at this. Nicole asked for this. <laughs> she goes, hey, it'd be great if there was tarps. I want tarps everywhere. And she's got to move on the tarps. And I told her for half the project that she couldn't have her tarps because I wasn't a real coder and she should have married a real coder. <laughs> and then uh, when I was mucking about doing something completely different, uh, I accidentally nearly made the tarps. And then I realized, ah, oh, just be a bit of So she's a rigid body. But the thing that makes it doable, that makes her climb over uneven stuff, is that she's a floating rigid body. She's attached to a spring, basically, that tries to keep her, her step up height above the ground. So she has no collision there. Uh, and that lets her feel, oh, I failed again. That lets her feel a lot like an old style platformer. I don't know how many people have played Sonic who have played Mario. But yeah, they, they aren't like rigid cubes. If in Mario or Sonic, you're coming up to the edge of something and you hit it like this, it doesn't go and hit you down. There's that sort of softness there. And that floating on a spring technique gives you that softness. Uh, I also proved that I did remember a little bit of physics in that every time she jumps up, she applies an equal force downwards. <laughs> Two people are impressed by that. Nobody else cares. <laughs> this is my life. 
I do these things after my brain hurting for six months and I show my wife and she goes, huh? And I go, that was really hard. And she shows something that she's light mapped and everyone ooze over it. But anyway, that's an example of how I solve tricky problems is basically I cheat. Uh, I can't write a physics system, so I used Unity's physics system. It's doing most of the work there. Yes, I had to learn how to apply forces the right way, and there were a few tricky problems. There's a, little, a few little hacks here. As she slides down this wall, uh, she doesn't bounce off it, because try as I might, if you, Unity just wants to, because physics, when it has a collision, it puts a little force to stop it penetrating. It will tend to drift away from it, which didn't feel right. So she actually has a little bit of suck that sucks her to walls. Jump up there. Oh, and that's, don't, you didn't see that. Uh, I switch her, I switch the physics off and just turn her into uh, an animated thing when I need to do tricky things like that. That's terrible animation, I've got to fix it. But it's a cheat. And that's how I solve all my hard problems, is I cheat and I use systems that are already there. Because I'm not a big brain person. I will go into that more later on. But that's more just to prove that yes, I can code here. I'll just quickly run this one too. This is the two level demo that we'll be taking to GDC. It's still dodgy in a lot of places because we have five days of frantic polishing to go before we get to GDC. I'm not going to GDC. I'm staying home and looking after children. Some of the trickiest code I've done is little things that nobody cares about, like positioning the speech bo uh, balloons correctly. Should we the volume down a bit? Yeah, please. Just plug it in. Why am I looking up there to play it? I've got it right in front of me. I didn't realise that. Oh yeah, there's, there you go, there's a real physics box. If I'd pushed that box onto one of those cloth things, it would have all worked. So as I said, I'm leveraging the physics system, so everything's unified. I don't have to worry about edge cases or weirdness, apart from bugs in the physics system. It's, what? Ah, the lighting. No, I'm lighting nothing. Um, she, she's adjusting to the lights, isn't she? Oh, physics, yeah. Well, the Unity's built-in system is fairly intelligent, so most things are asleep. As soon as they stop moving a certain threshold, they put them to sleep, and they're only woken up when some force or other thing touches them. Uh, what? Yeah, well, I mean, that's it. And that's another thing that I do all the way. If Unity's got it, I use it. I've run into other teams, and they go, oh, Unity, I... It's a good cross-platform renderer, but we rewrote the level editor and we rewrote the asset system and we rewrote that. And <laughs> yeah, I probably couldn't do it and I don't have the time to. So if it's there, I use it. Um, up to the point where we will design our games to work with the existing technology, which is what I should have been doing for 15 years I was at Chrome. But uh, that, that's the funny thing. When you're using tech, and you can't walk next door and yell at the person making the tech, you have to learn to make do. So, uh, yes, if I were to go back and work with you guys now, you'd love it. Yeah, I'd have so much more time. I'd just go, hey guys, what have you got? All right, I'll use that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's insane. And you trying to figure out what core systems you can use amongst those five. Those, uh, those planks, they're boring, they're stiff. Uh, I like my flex oil. She's on fire at the moment. Uh -oh. oh, easily. Um, nothing you see here is difficult, otherwise I couldn't do it. Uh, these guys have to be replaced with the dynamic ones. They're simply Unity's uh, got a trail renderer. So I just made them pretty. There we go. Uh, the worst piece of code I've got in this project, I'll show you a snippet of it later, is that presentation screen there. Uh, it is ugly and convoluted and difficult for me to even understand and I only made it a few days ago. And I'll try and get the PowerPoint going. 
There is nothing really interesting on the PowerPoint. It is just my notes. And instead of holding your notes in front of you these days, you show them to the whole audience. I don't know who thought of that. But uh, so no, normally we give uh, people a bit of an intro. You Do just we? Sort of come in and you sort of roll them That's fine. I just, I just, well, as I say, I want to keep it informal. Who knows who I am? No one has any idea. Some people, yeah, you do, do. The people who know I am have the lowest amount of respect for me in this room. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, Leo, well, thank you very much. But that's only because I'm Nicole's husband. See, I'm only here she vouches I'm for me. I'm only here to take notes to tell her what you've said. From about. art to code, there is no divide. There we go. Now, will this actually? I. Hello, my name is Jason Stark. I'm often referred to as Starky because there are about one billion Jasons in the local games industry. Uh, there was one point in time when I was sitting and here, where I was sitting, there and there and there, we were all called Jason. Uh, I believe Schrodes was one of us. I can't remember the other two. But uh, that's why, it, Starkey, you might have heard of me there. I have 15, over 15 years of game dev experience uh, and I've, uh, I've managed to get all the way up to art director and led a team over several B titles. I'm not going to call them AAA. <laughs> because they were not AAA. I don't think there's any shame in uh, admitting to what they were. They had budgets of around about, uh, about 8 to 15 million, which sounds huge in today's indie environment and actually makes me, uh, oh, really, did I? Um, but uh, at the time, they were smallish budgets, uh, and we felt that we were under-resourced, which, once again, is hilarious. Um, all our clients were very happy. Uh, which means a lot to me. Viva Piñata Party Animals. I don't know if anyone knows that game. Uh, that's, that was my first game as art director. It got included in Microsoft's family bundle and they were really happy about it. And uh, there's a few people out there in Microsoft or possibly working for somewhere else uh, who are very uh, thankful to our team. It was belted out in about nine months of production time. And uh, we got it done. We got it done on time. We got it done without spending too much money or hopefully sending too many engine guys too crazy. You were mostly going crazy with Hellboy at the time. All of them. Uh, and yeah, uh, we did that again with uh, Guardians of Gahul, which we made you guys less happy because uh, that's, that's pretty much the example of the project I would never do again. We built, we designed the whole project to work on technology we didn't have, which was a bad idea. I would never do it again, but we still managed to get it done on time. And Warner Brothers this time was very, very happy with us. Uh, the, the last project I ever want, I worked on is my most prestigious, it was Happy Feet to the video game, uh, which I think I saw in a bargain bin somewhere once. Uh, it was the biggest catastrophe I can think of a video game. Uh, the high point was it, it got moved from the original team to us because they needed us to save it. Uh, Chrome went bankrupt halfway through the project. Uh, the team was bought by someone else. The project was restarted. And then we had the Brisbane floods. We had people leaving during it because we were obviously had no future as a company and I was having to keep this slowly dwindling, incredibly demoralized team of people together to push it out the door. Uh, I think it looks great and it plays great. And Kennedy uh, Miller Mitchell at KMM, they own the Happy Feet license at George Miller. They were really blown away with the quality and they thanked us profusely and then promptly fired all of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was probably just as well when you see what happened to their games department later on. Uh, so the point is, I'm very qualified to talk about art direction. I'm very qualified to talk about production efficiency in bad conditions and, and getting your B title projects done. Uh, and of course, I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk about code, which I know very little about. Uh, yeah, here's my list of things I don't know. I, if, if I were to get my job as a, a coder, uh, if, if disparity went to hell and I was searching for work and they needed someone who knew Unity, I would apply for a junior level position. I've never worked for a team. I've never had to dissect someone else's code. 
I've never had to make my code work with someone else's code. There's a lot of skills I don't have. I know the Unity API pretty well and I know games production pretty well. So if anyone here has any experience working as a coder, I consider you guys senior to me. Uh, here's an example, I don't know C++. I've looked at it once, it nearly sent me blind. It is, without a doubt, the ugliest goddamn language I've ever seen in my life. I, it, I just find it ugly. It's, ugh, I don't even know why. I just hate looking at it. C Sharp, mm, nice. Java, mm, nice. C++, it's got symbols. They love symbols. It's bleh. Anyway, uh, recursive functions, they confuse me. I know essentially the theory behind recursive functions. They're horrible. Uh, do they get used a lot? Well, I have to use recursive them. functions. Really? I see, I see a yeah. three on the back of his shirt. Yeah, that's suspicious. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, of course, yeah, yeah. Because functions confuse people who have worked with them for years. Okay. It's scary. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to treat recursive functions like I treat parallel parking. I'm never going to do it. <laughs> if you can avoid it, yeah. Uh, until you find yourself it's doing right. it, and then you'll go, oh. That's so handy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it is like that. I, I have driven, it, I believe that, because I've driven past so many parallel parks spaces in my life, and the kids are going, there's a park there, Daddy. Go, no, there isn't. <laughs> I don't see it. I, I still don't know where unit test is. What's a unit test? Someone tell me what a unit test is. I just don't know. It, it tests just a unit of code, tests one method. Right. That's it. Yeah, but yeah, there's like. Does jump when I tell it? Yeah. yeah. That's a their unit test, but Visual Studio's got like support for them or something. Yes, but not, do you, for not for games programmers. Can I put it on my list? Because I, I had a conversation with one coder, he was very passionate that I had to know what unit tests were. It's very, it's very useful for maintaining the long term health of code. Probably not so useful if you've got a game to deliver in three months yeah. and yeah. you've got to get the code done as quickly as possible. Now, see, that's awesome. That's absolutely awesome. Uh, I think everyone, I think games coders by nature are far more pragmatic than regular coders. And uh, that pragmatism I love to pieces. Um, and you don't find it online in tutorials about coding. Uh, I tend to find two things online. I find the, the correct coding tutorials where for some reason having a, a public variable is a sin against God and nature. Uh, <laughs> you've you've, <laughs> you've got to have, if in C Sharp, if you don't get set something, do you even know what I'm talking about? Auto properties? Okay, the people who know what auto properties are, you've got to use an auto property or you get taken outside and shot. Um, you find a lot of that online and you also find absolutely god awful shocking examples of code that even I know just shouldn't be shown to other people. A lot of Unity tutorials. Actually a lot of Unity stuff that's on Unity's site written by Unity people. You just go, whoa, that's terrible. Okay. So what I'm going to try and do here, God, this could be a six hour long talk if it takes me this long to get through. So what I'm trying to do, I'm not going to try and tell you about code because everyone, or nearly everyone here can do that better than me. I'm just going to try and give you a perspective. Uh, I'm going to show, try and show you things from, from how I've seen them and maybe at the end uh, show you a, a new way of thinking about code and about what you do. Maybe. Seriously, I'm just going to blather on and maybe it will be interesting. Uh, so how did I learn how to code? It was easy. I couldn't find a coder who would do what I told them to. I couldn't. This will be hilarious. Uh, at Chrome, I said, let's, let's, this, is, this is getting us nowhere, uh, Chrome Studios. This was about two years before it went down. But uh, it had been obvious that it was stuttering and burping along for about two years prior to that. I said, I'm getting old. Let's try and do my own thing. So I got a bunch of artists. And I'm good at telling artists what to do. So they got excited. They went, yes, we're going to do this project. UDK had come out. We go, well, UDK, it's easy. It's easy to make a game UDK now. That's fine. It's a publicly available engine. And that we were all excited and we had plans. And all we needed was a coder. So it's just some chump to do code, what we told them to. <laughs> and so I went and I asked my favorite coder uh, on the floor to, if, he'd, if he'd work with us. And that guy was Brendan. Uh, Ski Safari, Brendan. And uh, he turned me down, the fool. <laughs> um, he said, no, I'm working on my own thing. I go, really? We got a team of artists. We'll be good. He goes, ah. I'm all right. He wasn't working on Ski Safari then. He was working on, what was the crazy one with asteroids? Does anyone know what he did before then? Yeah. He's working on that. And he came out and did pretty well, and then yes, Ski Safari, and he certainly doesn't have to do what any artist tells him to do ever again. 
Uh, and then I talked to Cliff, and I just couldn't find a coder. Because you guys can make a game by yourself. It might look like shit, but it might not look like shit. Look at Minecraft. But... <laughs> <laughs> It might look appropriately like shit. And you can do cool procedural fractal stuff. You know, you can generate beauty with numbers. Uh, but you can't generate numbers with beauty. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many things we model, it's not going to, you know, make itself move. So I, I was forced uh, to learn how to code. I just went back to the team of excited guys and goes, it's fine, uh, it's fine, it, it comes with Kismet. It's got things that you drag and drop. Does everyone know what Kismet is? It's visual scripting, and what I quickly learned from Kismet was I hated visual scripting, and I thought it was stupid. I couldn't code, and still, after one night of using it, I could see that this was stupid. I did not understand, I still don't understand the point of visual scripting languages, which just seems designed to produce spaghetti. You like them? It is good. It is good? For some amateurs, it yeah. is actually good. Like, you can do some really cool stuff through hmm. visual scripting that isn't always, um, you should still do the same yeah, thing yeah. with code, but it means you have to learn code. <laughs> I tell you, yeah. you know, from a standpoint of a guy that doesn't basically yeah. code, um, it's quite good. I, I found it quite handy. So, so what do you use? Do you use Kismet or Playmaker in Unity? Or? Um, I had UDK for a little while. Yeah. Had a couple of things where yeah. I just made doors move and stuff like yeah. that. But then the whole project got abandoned because uh, just like yeah. myself, we we had a big team of people. Yeah. And I was working with Pirates of Hawaii team for a little bit. Hmm. They had their specific guy that was going to do all the coding and he just jumped ship. Yeah. So they went, right, we're changing engine. Yeah. And I said, right, well, stick it, I'm gone. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, well, no, it, it's powerful, but. It really wasn't for me, and it wasn't. I, I figured it wasn't going to make a game. What? I have to say it's practical when the behaviour you're trying to describe represents about less than about five lines of code. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. If you've got a level editor and he knows character moves into this trigger, door opens here, particles go off here, play cutscene there. It's beautiful for that, and it's almost wasteful to do a custom bit of code to do that sequence. So yes, I, I, I was a bit. I, I apologise. That's why I'm fully agree with you. Fully agree with thee, yes. Uh, but anyway, I, I figured out, let me correct that then, I figured out that visual uh, scripting wasn't going to get me what I wanted. And that, that I had to get more. And it was strangely enough also, I, my mind didn't like visual scripting, which maybe I'm a terrible art director. I actually preferred uh, lines of code to little boxes because I, I'm a naturally messy person. And my boxes got very messy very quickly. And uh, I found it easier to keep my code tidy. <laughs> no one look at my code. <laughs> so I looked at the UDK web documentation, which is weird because half of it's written for experienced coders coming to UD U Unreal, and half of it's written for people who've never learned to code before. Um, what I mostly learned, yes, was a deep and abiding fear of deep hierarchies and long functions and classes. Has anyone looked through the UDK classes, the Unreal Script classes? I have no idea what Chrome code looks like or what game code generally looks like, but the Unreal Script stuff, the classes were about 10 hierarchies deep. So you, you've got forever going up here. Okay, where, okay that fun where is that function defined? Okay. <laughs> Up here, okay, okay, so that's half, what was I? Oh, okay, and. I, I just got to get this in there. Yeah. You, you do remember when every other day you lot were like, we need Unreal, why are we rolling Mercury? We need Unreal, we've got to get Unreal. Total useless waste of because time. Because Unreal. Unreal, <laughs> Unreal would have only made your life a misery. <laughs> it's got a very good art pipeline. It's excellent. <laughs> Having said that, getting assets in and out of Unreal, I did prefer how we had it Chrome. It wasn't as bad as people say. No, getting assets in and out was good. The, the whole art pipeline in Unreal is very good and very integrated, probably because they've just done it their one way without having you know, 50 people all tell them how they'd like it done. Uh, and yeah, so all the bits we saw of Unreal was excellent because uh, we didn't have to wade through this crap. 
hard to hear, and so I it's confusing even for experienced programmers. Yeah. If you're, if you're coming to understand that yeah. system, I think I, I feel like there's a trend away from that. Uh, in, the, in the whole software industry? Yeah, well, particularly with um, Unity, which is so heavily component-based mm. and uh, has very shallow hierarchies generally. Well, the ones that they let you touch because mm. it's all sealed. And it must be frustrating for you guys. If you, have you used Unity? Yeah, we use it at work. I, yeah. I, in some ways, it's good being limited because when your boss comes along and asks you to do something impossible, you can say, I can't because Unity doesn't let me do that. So if you, if you had all the code for it, or yeah. if you had your own game engine, of course, you know, yeah, no, that's actually good. I, I, there is power in limitations, mm, mm. and there's a lot of productivity. Got, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's cool. Uh, I just wanted to do a brief aside. Okay, uh, is anyone here learning how to code? Is it, someone is learning how to code. All right. Yup. Good attitude. Good attitude. Actually, I, I, I say that. Um, I just wanted to tell if, if for the experienced coders here, for anyone jumping into code. Uh, object oriented is brilliant. It's it's a brilliant concept. It's it's a lovely idea. You, you make objects and you have instances and references to them. It's very very clever. When you're coming to learn code, for some reason that concept is very brain breaking. Uh, I, I don't know. You see the lines on the piece of paper and you go, okay, these are the lines on the piece of paper. I will follow this to here to here. And then when someone tells you that. <laughs> That's a class, and what the th there's this thing that's imaginary that's actually that the, the thing that's like gave birth to that thing. What you're supposed to do in theory, like yeah. you always work out this way, but you're designing software, yeah. so object oriented allows you to kind of break down. I don't know whatever you're trying to model in the real world, yeah, and make classes, make objects for that. that. It kind of the whole premise kind of breaks down when you start modeling abstract concepts, that's right. things that don't exist in the real world. Yeah, but it, it is genius, and I do love it now. Mm -hmm. But I, I just want for. Uh, I'm reminded of mountain biking. Uh, people have been mountain biking for 10 years. Have got no, they can't talk to people who haven't mountain biked. They go, oh, I'll just take you out into this fun ride. And there's like these drop-offs this big with spikes at the bottom. And they're going, what's wrong with you? I just wanted to give that sort of sense of perspective if you ever have to deal with someone. That's, that's something that I learned because I spent the first three years or so of my professional career yeah. writing procedural code in an object-oriented language. Yeah. Oh, these are objects. They're objects, yeah. Um, it was very funny. I, I taught my probably going to be son-in-law. Uh, I was just taking him through Unity. Oh, no, no, it was actually someone else. It was someone else. I'm getting my noobs mixed up. Uh, it's another kid I was teaching uh, as part of our Be Nice to uh, Kids with um, uh, Asperger's uh, thing that we do. Uh, and he, he'd gotten this bit of code working. I go, OK, this is interesting. Why is this? Why is this uh, variable here static? And he goes, oh, I was trying to access it from here, but it didn't work. But then I made it static, and it did. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's, that's sort of it. I just wanted to do that little aside. If you're ever teaching someone, expect that concept to not go into people's heads easily. Um, it didn't go into mine uh, easily either. Interestingly, Unity, which is what everyone's going to be using, makes it harder because there's an extra level of magic. Because it goes, OK, write this bit of code. OK, attach it to a game object. So this is interesting. Uh, Unreal was actually a better introduction to object-oriented coding, because I had to learn it. Because you were wading through the hierarchies, and you saw how inheritance work, and you saw how things were spawned and whatnot. Unity does magic, and it's really weird. Write a bit of code, attach it to a game object, drag that game object into your scene. You go, what, what's, what, what's happened? I, don't, I didn't call new on anything. What is is that an instance? When when was that instance created? What what's happening? Don't worry, it's magic. It all works. <laughs> uh, Unity loves doing that. It loves doing it's magic. Don't worry about it. You send magic everywhere. It'll be good. Strings are great. Don't worry about what a garbage collector is. That's for nerds. <laughs> You'll be fine. Um, I don't know why it does that because, yeah, it's, it's like that. It's like, oh, because we want to be noob friendly. You go, it doesn't make it easier for noobs, really. If I was to teach someone to code now, I would teach them uh, C sharp, uh, just shell scripts, you know, just little things like that. Okay, so they're making instances of classes by calling new on them, and they're getting rid of them, and they they're not worrying about the garbage collector yet. That that can come later. Yeah. 
I know, and so now I got to the point where I saw I knew how to code. Uh, making a game, this is a pain. Uh, is there resources? I couldn't find any. On how games, is someone shaking their head that doesn't fill me full of hope? How do you put a game together? How's it structured? What calls what? When, is there a game class? Is there level classes? Do you, where's the data stored, the thing? It's all up to you. Well, that's where Unity gets its power, because it tells you where to do that. It takes a whole bunch of that out of your hands. It, do, it takes a bunch... Object, stick it in the scene, hit go. Hit, you know. Yeah, hit go, but then... But, yeah, so to make a good game, yes, but you can see where they're going with that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, you don't, don't, don't worry about it. You just put a jumble of stuff in there, it'll be fine, and, you know... Uh, that's what, it's easy to put, do a demo in Unity. It's really easy to do a demo. It's a lot harder to get a game out with it. Um, so there's very few resources, most of them suck. Uh, this was the one advantage that I had. Uh, I wasn't a coder, but I'd worked in the games industry forever. So I knew when things sucked. I knew there was a shape of a game. I didn't know how you built it. I didn't know the exact specifics, but I knew what a game looked like. I knew the shape that it had to fill. Um, yeah, no one agrees, that's cool. It's useless asking a code or a game team how you make a code because they'll have a different answer for everyone. Actually, it's not useless because you should ask and you should get those different opinions and when you've heard 10 different ways of doing it, you can come up with your own way. Um, oh, yeah. So I knew what localization was. I don't know how noobs, I don't know how, because there's a lot of the poor bastards. These days, uh, I get parents ring me up my, my kid, they want to be a games developer. How do they be a games developer? And I'm pretty nice. I should say, don't. <laughs> Make them build houses or something. Um, don't, games developer. Actually, you know, it's a bit like um, uh, with Kung Fu monks. You know, the legend is, you know, they ask to be a Kung Fu monk and they reject you. And it's the persistent ones that sit outside in the rain for six months. They're the ones that you let in because that's what you need to do to be a games developer. But anyway, I have got no idea. Because usually my advice is, well, there's lots of stuff on the web and you can teach yourself and there's a community here and you can ask questions. But these poor bastards, they don't. At least I knew. I knew that wrapping your data in your code was a bad idea. I knew it had to sit over here. I knew that I was doing very bad things with my localization. I still don't have a localization system, but at least I know I should. <laughs> and state machines, I knew what a state machine was. I knew the idea of a state machine because I had been an animator. And when you're an animator, you know what a state machine is. And <laughs> what's a good way of implementing a state machine? What do people do? I talked to one coder. Uh, and he said, because I said, you can't just have a switch statement with lots of things. He goes, meh, sometimes. <laughs> meh, meh. Well, that goes back to what we were talking about before about pragmatism. Yeah. A pragmatic program is just going to switch case and done. Done. It's done. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry, but you will be amused. I lost birth of a project which was a single C file, 500 kilobytes in size, one great big switch statement, which was the entire game being ported from an arcade machine. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you have a copy of it? That would be awesome just to put in a museum somewhere or something. That's actually, I, I do wish there was. I, I wish there were more examples of code uh, because it's it's fascinating and wonderful, and uh, it, it's really interesting to the people who can read it and understand it. It's what? You're aware of GitHub? No. Oh, I've just learnt something. Is there lots of source code in there? Yeah. 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 GitHub is awesome. Really? Worth, worth reading? Well, well, I should have done this two years ago. We're open source, people keep their code these days. Oh, okay. So, like, there's code out there, and if you want to read it, you can. Yeah, cool, cool. Because I actually learnt a lot from, uh, from Engui. It was just a plugin that I bought, but it's structured in a certain way, and it was structured in a way, it's like the polar opposite of Unreal. If you, if you look through Unreal and then you look through NGUI, I don't know what happens if you put those two coders in the same room at the same time. They probably disappear and pure energy is released. Do um, you use any version control? Yes, absolutely. That's the other th advantage I had. It's fascinating to go in the Unity forums and someone goes, oh, I, think, I think it's probably good to use version control. And then you have people arguing and go, nah. <laughs> it's just, 
<laughs> okay, sure thing, dude. Yes, yeah, so we, we've got uh, SVN. You might want to look at Git. I mean, it's alternative. That's yeah. The reason why I don't use Git is because um, of Tortoise, Tortoise SVN. Tortoise it, Git is really good. I've used Tortoise Git. I didn't think it was I as good. Mercurial. It's got all the good stuff from Git. It's, it's simple and it's got a Tortoise implementation. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, looked at them. Yeah, that's it's yeah, that's so so so. I I have used Git for a bit, and yeah, on a small scale thing, I didn't feel it was giving me enough advantages. I believe it's a superior solution, but you know, it, it, from a practical day to day thing, I didn't feel the goodness. If you can get your head around the concepts uh, around distributed version control. Yeah, yeah. Mercurial is actually simpler than SVN, I, I believe, to use. Oh, really? Maybe not. Maybe not Git. That's a little bit of a tricky setup. But mm, okay. I would agree. If you're not into Git, yeah. use Mercurial. The, the other thing is, I, I also get SVN as I'm with DreamHost. Our website's hosted by DreamHost. Oh, yeah, well, it gives you completely unlimited SVN repositories, any number, any size. You just sort of for realsies. <laughs> I could archive my 60 gigs of photos in an SVN repo. So I don't know. I imagine they politely cough and send you an email if you do silly things with it. But there's Bitbucket and there's GitHub and there's Google Code. Are they all free? They're all free and they're all hosted on ridiculously huge servers all over the world and they're very fast. Oh, okay. There's plenty of choices. Well, this will be something to look at next project. Well, you know, I'm not changing mid-project. <laughs> Next project, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that you've got to do is look at these things. Okay, code entomology. This is just, as I said, this doesn't really fit anywhere. It's just random thoughts. Uh, th this is how I more or less classify if uh, coding was an RPG game. I'd give you three major stats. Okay, so we've got ninja. The ninja's the person who does ninja code. They're the crazy people, like some of the people sitting up there who love touching the metal, who coded VU code on the PS2 in assembly, keeping, was it two, two oh, I don't know, it was insane stuff, and then produced real-time wave systems that, you know, running on hardware that shouldn't be able to render a bloody sprite, and they do amazing super-duper things. And it's not just rele relegated to engine tech either, maybe they invent sorting algorithms that are just super amazing, and all the other amazing things that I can't possibly do and I have no interest in. They're ninjas. Uh, architects. They're the people that do the thing that I was talking about, that figure out the best way to put a game together. I often find your lead coders are your architects, and it makes sense to put them there because they've got a great head for structure. Uh, sometimes they get a little too into structure. <laughs> Maybe they go a little bit too far, a bit too obsessive about things fitting neatly and tidily. But, and then you have the implementer. Uh, as an animator, an artist, these are the people we love. Because uh, you go to them and you, you, you give them a catapult and you go, oh, it's a catapult, it's got an animation, it does this, and they go, fine. And they'll give you something and it will auto-track enemies and it will smoothly transition from one guy to the other and they'll suggest animations to you that are missing because uh, they'll go, oh, it really needs a pause here, it needs to do that. And the code that they produce, I don't know what their code looks like. Maybe it's freaking awful. Maybe the other coders hate them. But the end result is just beautiful because uh, all coders are unavoidably designers because no video game designer in the universe is going to break their design down fine enough for it to just be slotted in. So there's always decisions that have to be made with the AI on enemies and the timing of punches and the way that a, the way that a health bar goes bloop and moves up, you know? It sounds like you're describing the implementer as someone who does rapid prototypes and you're right, other code is not me. <laughs> Possibly. It's not just a, it's a person who, who, who does something and the end result to someone who doesn't know anything about code or anything, it looks fantastic. They yes, go. Exactly. They do, they do the prototype. Yeah. But the thing is, then, then someone else has to do something. Has to clean it up. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So, okay. That, yeah. So, if that is the three prototypes, Emma, is, it, is this how you guys view yourselves? Do you see this in yourselves? No, is this just completely weird? This is purely my perspective on life and everything? That's fine. A lot of their little ninja guys to us do a lot of architecture. Yeah, that's right. There's crossover. There's crossover. They'll pick two. Yeah, that's cool. Well, these are your tri-stats. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, there are people who are great at all three, but that's just sort of... No, it's not. Isn't there? The ninja are fundamentally different people. Really? <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. But if you had to pick one, one of those traits, you were on a one-man code team. Well, they could be fundamentally, uh, they could be the same person if they completely, if they rejected their architecture status. Yeah, that's true. Pick you two. could do it. You <laughs> pick two. You can pick any two. I've met in all of those people. It's <laughs> cool. But if you had to pick one attribute, you've got one, one man, they have to make a game. There's no other coder. There's only one coder for a team. Which one would you pick to make a game? If you had technology, you want the implementer who we call the content code because they're going to get stuff done. That's right. And that's how I survive. Because I'm an artist, I'm an animator, and I know how the health bar should go pop. And I know how the enemy should turn around so it looks good. And I've played a lot of video games, so I've got a good feel for design and whatnot. And that's how I've survived. I, yeah, problem is, because I, I can get, as I say, I can get away with not being a ninja. Because I, I either hire someone to do a little bit of ninja stuff, Bruno, uh, but I could survive without him because it's just visualizing. But mainly, Unity is, I don't want to call them ninjas. <laughs> they get the job done, they give me something, I can make it work. Um, the problem is, being a lousy uh, architect, I'm slow. I'm inefficient and slow, that's why I said I regard myself uh, it's like a junior level. Uh, I think anyone here would throttle me if they had to work with me uh, as a professional coder. I feel terrible because uh, I'm often lagging behind Nicole. Uh, I'm getting better, I hope, uh, but it slows me down. But the end result is good, and you can always take longer to finish a game. But if you finish a game quickly, but it looks and feels like shit, you've wasted your time. So that's how I'm surviving, uh, and that's how I think pretty much, uh, I think a lot of people survive like that these days. A lot of uh, hits on the App Store, I think, aren't being made by particularly good well-rounded coders, they're just people who've got a, a good feel for uh, making games. Dealing with being a sucky architect. Yeah, keep learning. I just learned something here today. Where was that place where I can find lots of good code? GitHub. Okay, I'll, I'll hang out there. I love hanging out places like that because I try to talk to my wife about it. That's awesome. <laughs> Hi, I learned this cool trick about... I'm always going to pick sorting because I know nothing about sorting. A really fast way of sorting things. It's cool. Look, I just put it in my code there and she won't care. <laughs> uh, and yeah, you have to deal with your own code. Nothing, nothing tells you what bad code is better than having to deal with your own bad code. Because when you write it, you don't know if it's bad or good. You go, I'm writing code, and it did this stuff, and then she can jump, and that's great. And then later on, when you go, maybe it'd be good if she can wall jump. I'll, I'll just add that to, oh, God. Oh, why? Um, <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Um, and it's some of the things that helped me, and, and this is one of the the cool perspective things that maybe you guys, uh, I don't know, maybe you've encountered it, maybe you haven't, but as I was learning about code and code design, I realized that uh, structuring stuff is like structuring stuff. Um, uh, loose coupling. Loose coupling? Do I understand this concept quickly? We want, we've got a class here, we've got a class here, or instances of classes. They don't, you, you can make, okay, I've developed this functionality and all hinges on this class have an exact reference to this one and calling an exact method on it, and this one also has to have a reference to this, and they're tightly coupled, and if anything happens, it all breaks. But that's a bad idea to do with people and moving information around in teams. It's a bad thing to do with assets. If you've got an asset and it, it's that precariously linked to other assets, it breaks through, that's also a bad thing. The way you send messages around in your code is a perfect analog to how you send messages and communicate information in real life. And I was uh, constantly surprised by how applicable it was. And that's probably why object-oriented coding works, is because they are pretend objects and you can model uh, things from the real world onto it. And I found it was really weird that being uh, an art manager, <laughs> in managing a team uh, helped day-to-day uh, -day on developing systems for getting my game working properly. As I said, like art assets and, and production teams, if you've managed an art asset and a production team, you will have a sense on how to develop a structure that is more robust and works. Stunned silence, that's what I like to see. 
My profound believer in coding efficiency, attitude is better than intelligence. I came up with this theory one day. I'm not as smart, the same level of smart every day. <laughs> some days I am smart and some days I am not so smart. Uh, and and I, the, well, I found that out because I used to play chess on the way to work on the train, on a chess app uh, on something, I think it was my phone. And you set the difficulty. And some days I could smash the AI at a certain difficulty and some days I would struggle with it at the lowest. And I found it, it was really interesting just how much my intelligence went up and down. Uh, which, you know, it's good to know before you start the day. You can go, oh wow, I'm stupid today, cool. <laughs> Don't make any big decisions. But uh, you get to recognize and you get to have a feel for when you're not maybe your sharpest. And I found that uh, there was this day and I was gluggy headed and I wasn't that smart and I sat down and I coded and it went brilliantly well. And it was because I wasn't, I, I said beware, beware of the rabbit hole. This might be just personal for me. In fact, it almost certainly is just personal for me, but maybe someone in this room will relate to it. What's the rabbit hole? The rabbit hole drives my wife crazy. It's me doing this. for hours, days, weeks, mulling over some structural problem. It mightn't be what I'm working on at the moment. It might be something else, some puzzle solution. If I do it that way, state machines. I have a terrible weakness for state machines. I should have just done a big switch statement. <laughs> Seriously. Um, it's, you know, I can just get lost in trying to find the best solution. It's, it's such a terrible temptation. You go, oh, you've got a solution, but you know, it's not, is it the best solution? There's probably a better one out there. You know, think about it some more when the kids come home and you should be bathing them. Uh, wife will be happy if you do that. And yeah, it's, I, I can get lost in there very, for a very, very long time. And it's, it's not productive. And I found you're better off or well, at least I'm better off. And I learn more and I learn it faster if I just do something. And so these days I, I have a ration for my thinking time. I'm going to do something completely new, which happens to me a lot because I don't have much experience. I've never done this before. I've, I'll only give myself a few minutes to think about it. Because you should think about it a bit. You maybe do a bit of research and whatnot, but, and then just do it. If it's bad, that's fine. You'll refactor it later. It's fine. And <laughs> yeah, there we go. You wouldn't do it that way? How do you approach it? I think there's a, there's a trade-off for a grammar that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can yeah. get too far in a rabbit hole, it's short, but if you're, gonna, if you're gonna make a piece of code, which is probably gonna be used once or something, yeah. and, and maybe after the project, yeah. you can look at it again and do it differently next time. Yeah. That's fine, but yeah, like Mo was saying, on the engine team, you know, if, you, if you're uh, game, yeah. you're thinking about the Where game that needs it now, yeah. but you need to know, <laughs> yeah. you also need to know what the other game might possibly need it for, because if you refactor for one game, you're going to break a lot of other people as well, and it's just, yeah. it's, you've got to put a bit of thought, even if you can't fully predict the future about what everyone's yeah. going to need and how it's going to affect, you need to also architect it in a way that you can step in and refactor certain parts of it without hurting people. So you know that, okay, I can still do this. Yeah, yeah. And still get away you can move this around, change. and from the outside, it looks like nothing's changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, some parts here you can identify. It's a structural, it's a structural problem. Yeah, see, so you see, yeah, that's cool. Security yeah, will, will result in you doing that. You're going to get the um, yeah. interface right. The interface is what's important. The thing that yeah, absolutely. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, that is the most critical thing how other bits of code interface with that bit of code. If you, if you can get that sorted, then it doesn't, maybe this is a steaming pile of something or other, but if you can fix it up and it's all the ins and outs, you know, what go, it's fine. That's, that's very good. As I said, that's very personal because I, all my code is short term. Maybe it will get used for the next project, maybe not. If it's good, it'll get used for the next project. If it's not, it will tell me what not to do for the next project. Um, so yes, uh, doing an engine that five teams work on, ugh, I wouldn't do that. Don't, don't, you should do something else. Um, 
<laughs> what are you guys? Are you guys still you engine coders doing this? You can architect it in a way which you think is going to be great. Yeah. With all sorts of teams, and then one team will say, "No, we really want to change this way. We really want to change this way." And yeah. then it's yeah. about ten meetings later on, and you're just told to change it. And then you change it, and then the other game teams aren't happy with you and I. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I think Indies is so much more efficient. Then it's like um, Happy Feet 2. One of the things that, well, yeah, you were, you were there. It was as, as soon as Chrome went down and, and bust, and, you know, or, or as soon as the other team started dying off, it actually became more efficient because we only had to care about ourselves. And you can do uh, you can do things just for you, and it doesn't matter if it's not going to, if it's going to screw someone else over because there is no someone else. Uh, rabbit hole is particularly bad for me too because I'm also the designer. So I don't know if that it's a strength because I know what the designer is going to do in the future, but that's actually bullshit because I don't know what I'm going to do in the future because no designer is that good, and certainly not me. You'll try things out, and they won't work. They won't be fun. They won't go, and you'll go, oh, and then you'll get ideas. And you'll be the annoying designer screwing over the coder who is also you. <laughs> um, so yeah, predicting the future. It, it, this is what I just found for me. I, I found it just quicker to do things. Uh, but yes, uh, I'm a, that's a small scale. Extraordinarily, there is pretty much no smaller scale project. So it works for that. Um, Oh, the refactoring bug. Oh, yes. Leading up to uh, PaxOz, when I'd scheduled out everything, I lost an entire five-week milestone because I thought it would be a good idea to rewrite my state machine twice. That's not refactoring either. I did some looking up of what the word means, and uh, I read this, this really nice bit that goes, OK, there's refactoring and there's rewriting. Refactoring is good, rewriting is usually not good. It should only be done if it's really, really important to do. And I was, I was just fiddling. This yeah? is where um, unit tests actually come in. Yeah. Because that, they'll actually verify that the behavior is the same after you've refactored. Yeah, that's important. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's really important. Uh, yeah, I got. I blew so much time, I felt so much bad. We, 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 I felt so much bad. I did feel so much bad. Um, we did not have time then. Uh, we were being less than awesome parents. We were very tired. And yeah, I wasted this whole amount of time just basically tinkering. I, I, I saw my state machine and went, oh, I can see all these problems with it. These problems are so obvious and in my face and they're kind of annoying because they're imperfections and I don't like imperfections. So I rewrote it this other way and realized that it was worse, so I had to put it back how I had it. <laughs> yes, yes, it was a subversion, but I didn't do that very tidily either because I was tired and you're in a rush, so you're checking in bits and bobs and they're all tangled in your check-ins and you don't have a nice little neat Branch. Uh, I, um, I learned about branches. Uh, refactoring a couple of months ago. Yeah. Um, despite the guy who makes um, the jet brains refactoring tools, I can't remember what his name. All right. But, yeah. Um, so you know, like you, you, the code's evolving. It's sort of yeah. decreting crud, and eventually you want to go back and refactor it and clean it up a bit. Yeah. And he said refactoring is is the process of making the uh, cleaning up the code to make it look like you designed it that way in the first place. Yes. Time. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a brilliant way of putting it. Yeah. Um, Yes, because so when, someone, when someone looks at it, it goes, oh, very good. Yes, uh, yeah, not so easy to see the problems you will cause. Uh, yeah, I learned that one. Why do I keep looking up here? I've got it in front of me. Silly. Uh, yes, I developed a golden rule. This is my definition of, uh, of good code. Now, this will be different from you guys once again because you're dealing with five projects that depend on you. You're dealing with code that could be around for 10 years. I'm dealing with code that will be around for 12 months and will only bother me. So my definition, because there's a lot of argument about structure and coding practices and what you need to do not. So this is what I developed for me, is it does the job it's supposed to do, obviously, and does it well, and uses up the least amount of my time over its lifespan. So I quite like this rule because then it, it ties together dirty hacks and doing things the proper way. 
because sometimes in the right situation, the dirty hack is the best thing you can do because it's near the end of the project. You know it will get it out the door. You know with 95% certainty you won't have to touch it again. And then you can move on and do the other 20 things that you have to do. It also encompasses code that's usually done at the start of the project that needs to lay a nice foundation for the rest of your game and needs to be done properly. And uh, I just quite like that because I think that encompasses everything. I think every bit of coding advice uh, about structure, about practices and whatnot, it's just trying to make code that doesn't chew up everyone's time and make everyone's life painful over its lifetime. Um, and that's how I sort of get out of the rabbit hole and that's how I try to evaluate everything. Um, I also accept the fact that there is no perfect solution. Um, I, nothing that you come up is going to be perfect. Uh, singletons, has anyone read about singletons? Apparently it's cool to say they're bad now and you shouldn't ever use them because there's these other things that you can do and there's pages of arguments which I find quite addictive to read. I don't know why. Uh, when you get these codes, <laughs> there's this great one on the Unity forums are talking about singletons. Because I, I, I generally use them, they're handy sometimes, managers in Unity. Uh, I do a very simple thing, it's just like a few lines. But uh, this guy is quite clever. By inheriting from a class, it automatically made everything a singleton. I thought, oh, that's pretty clever. And then another coder pops up and goes, well, actually, that will break in this edge case, so you should, you should add this structural code. And then another person pops up and goes, well, you know, theoretically you shouldn't do that, you should be doing this, and it became, and by the end of page 10, it was this monster base class that replaced me having to type out three lines every time I wanted one. And uh, I, I just think that can be avoided by going, guys, chill, it's fine. It's, you just, just relax, you have to type out the same thing. Sometimes copy and paste is not the end of the world. Uh, and my last thing is, every code's gonna make problems. And if you're the only one on the team, Design your code so it causes problems you like to fix. Uh, that was um, design your code so that you like the look of it. So that you know, okay, uh, a good one is uh, compo component-based architecture. The challenges with component-based architecture: if you've got a million classes flying around the place, so it's always communication, getting classes talking to other classes, and whatnot. I like that problem. It's, I, I just enjoy it. I, I like the, the messing about with lots of little pieces and getting the little pieces all dancing together. I guess because I was uh, a manager and I liked having my team of artists. I liked my team of artists all talking to each other and I like solving the communication problems. So I have virtual minions. Yes, I don't need real friends. I make my own friends and I make them get along. Uh, and once again, this isn't appropriate for a lot of you guys here because you're working on teams. But for the people who are working in one or two man teams, uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. Design your code. Because every code is going to make some problem. Uh, even my favorite bit of code, which I think I might be able to show later, uh, it, it's got problems. It's got weaknesses. But they're weaknesses I can live with. And uh, I don't mind. Random opinions. Uh, yeah. I distrust overly formalized organizational systems. I touched upon, uh, upon that with the singleton. Sometimes it just, it's the pragmatic thing. Scrum, who's used Scrum? Who loves Scrum? No one loves it? Okay, if anyone yeah, loves it, look, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do apologize, I'm not saying. It's one of those things that like, you take it, you, mod you take the bits that work, you throw the bits that don't work. And you modify to suit your needs. And then we're back to pragmatism. That's they excellent. They like to have you think that, though. They like to have you do it exactly the way they say. You'd be surprised. We have bloody scrum masters that are like professionally paid Fight. to go and do that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they give us all training, and we had to like get these little decks of cards and all this crap. So people are making an industry. Yeah, I know. But it doesn't mean you have to do it that way. No, you don't. But when you are forced to do it that way by the company, it's no problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And I agree with both of you. I agree with both of you. I think there's some brilliant ideas in Scrum, but they're overly formalized thing. I mean, when you can be a certified Scrum master, 
<laughs> when, you, when you have to go out and you have to be trained and you get a certificate telling that you that you can be a scrum master, I think that maybe someone's put a little bit too much work into you know a, a structure for structure. So. Guidelines to help yeah. people get stuff done, and you know, some people realize that they could make it build an industry or that make money out of it, but yeah. you can just ignore that. Yeah, they can just take the bits that work. And actually learn yeah, learn yeah. I, I think the best answers are always fuzzy, like that. I, I don't think uh, I think black and white answers. If if I ever meet a coder who's really, you know, they've got that fervor when they talk about a subject, they become the, the, the spit starts coming out of their mouth, <laughs> and and they know they're right. That's, that's when you go, oh, I don't think you are. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the bigger the organization, the more you need formalization. That's true. As well, right? That's so true. If you have five people, you can throw scrum out the window. Yeah. If you have 5,000, you need some way you agree on working. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's why I'm saying uh, everything I say here has got a big caveat of this is just my perspective on my situation because yeah, exactly. I've, I've got uh, Disparity Games is technically a company we incorporated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got as many company directors as we have employees. <laughs> yes. We each other. Yes, that's right. That's right. We've got oh, we've got a production team of over thirty people. You know, and HR of like five. That's important for every company. Um, so yeah, this is this is very sort of scrappy, indie, small scale stuff. It's um, there's probably there's probably situations where it is appropriate and it works well. Oh yes, random opinions, uh, uh, elaborate code structures. It's pretty much the same. I was, I was just saying those two things are related. Uh, anything that's overly formalized an organizational system, whether it's in code, whether it's in real life, I just instinctively distrust and start backing away from it. Um, even though it's weird, I'm a noob. I hate C++. I think it's the ugliest language ever devised by man or animal. I would actually be in favor of Unity moving to it because I think uh, there's a bit of silliness at the core of Unity. Garbage collections killing anyone who tries to do serious stuff with it. You do serious stuff with it, do you? What do you think of the garbage collector? Um, every so often we have to invoke it manually to, to yeah. make sure it can deterministically. Do you let pe your, your most people... Of time, most of the time it's not an issue. And we, we just yeah. throw memory around a lot of the place. <laughs> <laughs> and we do some big stuff. Like we do some really? Um, it's, it's, they're, not, uh, they're serious games, but it's... Like we, we do big kind of like landscapes with, with lots yeah. of um, vehicles and, and people and lots of buildings, like, right. like you know, 20 kilometers square, that kind of thing. We, yeah. we struggle to make that kind of thing in work in Unity, but it's, it's not due to memory or garbage collection. Oh, right. It's OK. Yeah. There you go. I'm very impressed uh, because, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of people in big systems in Unity just running into problems because of memory leaks and mm. just garbage collecting. We do, we do, we do run out of memory, but it's, um, it's just too much. It's just too much, too yeah. Much little things make me cranky, like, you know, having a neat little thing like for each, for each in C Sharp. Does everyone know the function for each? I love for each. It's pretty. I like pretty things in code, I don't know why, probably because I'm an artist really. Uh, I'm not allowed to use for each because it uh, allocates an enumerator which causes garbage. So I have to do ugly C++ style for loops. <laughs> Yuck. And it's a wash with things like that. Or am I crazy? Oh no, the .NET one is good. The Unity one is based on Mono and not even the latest Mono. It's the Mono from like five years ago because guess what? The people who make Mono would like some money and they suspect Unity has some. And so Unity is stuck with a five-year-old garbage collector that wasn't as good as the .NET collector, uh, garbage collector back then. So. Even though it's all magic and don't worry about it and allocate and like, I, I love the Unity tutorials about Link, L I N Q. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I know stuff you don't know. <laughs> Suck it. <laughs> it's okay. It's useless. <laughs> it's absolutely useless. Not true. We, we use it a lot. Really? Yeah. It makes garbage all over the place. How do you survive? Uh, it doesn't bother us. It just doesn't. It doesn't seem to show up. I mean. Really? We, we like. Um, you can use it for anything, but like we love it because. Um, Oh, it's great. We get a lot of data from clients. That, yeah. You know, sometimes we need to read that in and change it. But in Unity, yeah, it's great. You're not on iOS, though, are you? Yeah. 
No, no, so, so we, we do PCs. Now. Yeah, so see, I think iOS, yeah, it makes a big difference because on iOS you live in fear of garbage. Um, and yeah, as soon as you know that, you, you can't use Link. And there's all these tutorials in Unity going, oh wow, when you're a real coder in C Sharp, you, you'll learn Link and it's great. And it is great. And then you'll learn after you've learned it and you've put it all throughout your code and you're getting these uh, regular stuttering pauses on your iOS device, you'll learn that you have to take it out. That's another thing that may change if they update the latest mono. Yes, it was, if they update to the latest mono. Um, if, if they update, which it's obviously business um, decision rather than a code decision. Yeah, there must be licensing. There's some licensing weirdness because they don't comment, they don't say anything, and that's. The, the other big thing with them is that they've actually changed uh, the mono code base. Yes. And so integration of the new code base into their isn't straightforward. Is, is very free, yeah. yeah. No. So. Yeah, because I know that you could do um, mono on iOS, I think through Unity, before mono supported it on iOS years and years ago. I think Unity actually did their own. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a big mess now. And it's like, really, I, I'd like to just be done with it and go C++. And then it would get rid of uh, a whole lot of people off the forums in one fell swoop. I'm curious to know what that means to you exactly. What? Going C++. Going C++. Oh, just support the C++ language, dropping C Sharp, moving to C++. It's a uh, so not high level code, is yeah. and they're not, they're not having a garbage collector. Yeah, not having a garbage Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Because once you start worrying about allocations to this degree, it teaches you a little bit about what is going on behind the scenes. And if I'm having to worry about it to this degree anyway, I may as well be doing it properly and getting all the associated benefits. But maybe I'm only saying that because I see the problems I have now and I can't see the problems that would cause. <laughs> so maybe I'm a bit too confident. I think it would be beneficial for a lot of people to learn C++ or any language that has to match memory before yeah. learning. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Because once you start seeing what's going on, it's all, it sort of clicks and you go, Ah, oh. and it's funny because you guys are all old school and like uh, James Podesta and whatnot. I mean, you came from coding on the metal and moving stuff around. And, you know, I, I remember arguments in the engine room about C versus C++, uh, which is quite amusing in tech because you hear C++ for C sharp arguments these days. And, uh, you know, you, you, you learned how to code with that in mind. And me, I'm only, I'm like learning backwards from super high level to actually finding out what it is I've been doing for the past two or three years. Um, I don't capitalize my C-sharp properties. Take that, Microsoft. Um, <laughs> who capitalizes their C-sharp properties? Microsoft. That's fine, you may as well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's funny, we had this conversation with, it. it's just a funny little thing, this isn't important, but it's just a funny little thing that I like talking about. We had a conversation with James Podesta and Bruno and someone else, and uh, yeah, we tended to get more naming conflicts if you capitalize them, and because uh, it, if you don't capitalize them, it lets you smoothly move from just a, um, uh, what's not a property? Uh, well, just a variable, you know, to a property seamlessly, and you don't have to go renaming things. And uh, Unity doesn't capitalize it, and probably for the reasons I just said. But it's not a big deal. I just thought maybe we'd get someone jump up and go, "Ah, oh, you have to capitalize them." The thing I liked about um, the Microsoft style. Yeah. I mean, it's consistent across their API. Yeah. And I started programming C sharp five years ago. Um, not really for game development, yeah. for tool development. And um, so using a lot of Microsoft APIs. So it would be really good for tool development. If, if you follow their standards and it looks like your code kind of, kind of fits in. Yeah. The other nice thing about um, that is that if you're running a team, mm. then you don't have to necessarily make a coding standard. No. So here's the Microsoft standard. Yeah. Read this 500 page document, that's what we do now. I do actually follow the Microsoft standard, at least uh, as best as I understand it. <laughs> Uh, I, I do actually follow it in all regards except for capitalizing the properties. I just found it was just a little bit more convenient not to. 
Um, oh, and I, I love I love this get private set. I love it. I feel like a real coder whenever I use it. Um, I like it because it really works in its chosen job, and I like it because it communicates to me what's going on. Yeah, there's a there's a value. It's going to be read by other things, and it's only going to be set internally. I just like how descriptive it is. It's, it's just one of my little nerd code things. Uh, whenever I uh, whenever I type that in, I feel a little bit happy. I, I also feel like I'm doing my job properly too. That I'm encapsulating things and my code's being a bit tidy. Yeah, everything outside, you don't need, need to know how this value is being derived. Don't worry about it. It it's just belongs to this. And I try to avoid comments. I, it's probably a silly hang-up of mine, but I always see comments as a sign of failure. Because if my code is so bad, I can't understand it. I probably shouldn't be typing dash dash and typing an explanation. I should probably make it more readable. Because I mean, the only person who's going to read it is me. Um, and yeah, there have been a few times when I've had to type comments to understand what I've done. And uh, a good uh, quote I've heard is um, the code tells you how it does it. Yeah. Comments tell you why, why it does it. Yeah, that's true. Um, still, it's yeah. too, it makes me worry <laughs> whenever I feel I have to type a comment. Although it, it's. The one thing that I should do is a little bit more documentation because sometimes I'll, I'll do a nice system and then I'll forget how you're supposed to use it. Yeah, I was about to say, I think for me, I like comments because I don't remember how I coded five years ago. Yeah, I'm it was. different coder now than I was then. True. I look at something from five years back, I don't feel familiar with that anymore. Because you're a different person. So I now have to read my comments and go, oh yeah, I remember how I was. But the comment helps. Yeah, no, fair enough. It tends to live longer than a year. I suggested. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, I could do that because I've written a, a, a little object pooling system. Uh, it's nothing, it's a few lines. Anytime I say the word system, it'd better be small or it makes me nervous. I've discussed that. Um, but I keep forgetting how I'm supposed to use it because it's not immediately obvious because it's not a big infrastructure, don't worry about it system. It's a you have to put the right things in the right places and I forget what I'm supposed to do. So, um, I think I'd almost prefer to document rather than comment in the code, or if it's comments, it'd be like half a page of comments. When you're using the pooling system, remember to attach this component to whatever, and then blah, 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 blah. There's some good code. I don't know if this is good code. Maybe it's freaking awful. Uh, maybe, maybe it's terrible, but this is the, my favorite thing that I've done. Uh, first of all, what is it? It's pretty obvious what it is. It's a little tweening thing. It just tweens some position. Uh, there's a there's a base class there. In here, look, I got over my fear of inheriting things. I was paranoid of that. But, uh, that's how badly UDK had burnt me. I didn't use inheritance for the first 18 months of coding for anything. Uh, and sometimes you know component-based systems make sense, and sometimes it's stupid when you could just <laughs> do some simple inheriting and fix a a, a very easy problem. So it's things that I like about this. It's small. It's really easy to understand. Well, it's easy for me to understand. It's pretty clean. And uh, it solves a problem in, in a different way. I got the idea from NGUI, and I would use NGUI's system. Uh, for some reason, people who use Unity are obsessed with coding tweening systems. There's about 30 of them. Uh, some of them cost money, some of them are free. I don't know why you'd pay for them when there are so many good free ones there. They're usually enormous. They're usually pages and pages and pages of quite complex code that scare me and make me convinced that they're very good coders. I could never code as good as them. Uh, and then and I looked at Anguis and all he does is he attaches, he does these tiny little components and he attaches it to something. And you've got a built-in instance of an object, because there it is, it's components attached there. You don't have to worry about memory allocations, because it's there, it's attached to the object. As long as you're being sensible with your objects, the memory will be sensible. And it's, it's very easy to adjust, and Unity's got all these built-in systems. It's data-driven, because you've got the publicly exposed variables. It's easy to just attach things. Uh, the base class on this, you can't see it here, but all I had to do was publicly expose uh, a variable which means you can drag another tween base onto it and it will call that when this one's done. And then I went, oh, what if I make that an array? 
So a tween can call any number of tweens when it's done. And then tweens don't actually have to move positions because you just inherit from tween base and they can be timers. They can play particle systems. They can call six other ones. Yeah, they fire off events when they're done. And all of a sudden, by dragging and dropping components and leveraging all the functionality that Unity's already put in there, I've got this crazy tween system that goes beyond just tweening a box moving from there to there and can be this whole special effects event system. And the, the base, I don't have the base class here because it didn't fit very well on the thing, but it's, so it's not big. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's made from these tiny pieces. There's virtually no code into it. The base class is like twice as long as that. There's nothing to it, but I get all this complex data editor-driven functionality out of it. And that's my favorite thing that I've done. I, I did that uh, a few days ago because I couldn't make NGUI's tweeners work. They break randomly. I don't know why. Maybe I'm not using them properly. He doesn't document anything. He charges a hundred bucks for it with no documentation. Here's some bad code. Here's some bad code. It keeps going on. Oh, oh, here's another thing. I, I might as well talk about nerdy code stuff. Overriding methods. I've got a few overrides in there. Um, something that bugs me about virtual functions and overriding them is some, depending on how you've structured your code, some you want to call the base class of, your base dot whatever to start off with, and some you don't. How are you supposed to remember? If I'm just inheriting and it says, oh, you haven't implemented that, oh, you, you type in override, you get a lovely list of functions you can override. How are you supposed to remember which ones you're meant to call the base functionality on and which ones you're not? You're just overriding. Documentation. Documentation? Yeah, yeah. You should just have a consistent approach to that. That, either you do or you don't, it's a classic problem. That's exactly what I've done. Okay, I did something right. <laughs> okay, th this is what I've decided. Pretty much if I've got an override, it overrides. And so if I want to do the base thing, what I'll do, is, and this is why that is called awake children, because the base class has the awake function, which is uh, people here who don't use Unity, Unity just calls awake. It's an initialization function. So it calls awake on the base class, and then the base class calls another function called awake children, which is blank in the bank of base class. And that's what I override to add the functionality. And that way, I'm always overriding and never calling the base class. So that's my little way of doing it. And that's not how I do it through all my code, because I just decided to do that. <laughs> but that's how, that's how I will set things up. So does that make sense? Is that good? I think it's good, works for me. Consistency? No. I just figured it must be a problem that other people have had, and I was just wondering. Everyone who's got the coders come up against that at some point or another. Yeah, okay, so it's not just me. Because it was one of those things I'm doing it, and I'm going, wait a second. I, I don't know, I was overriding some functions, and I go, I don't know whether I should call base on this or not. And then I'd have to go back, and I'd have to go back a few places, and I'd have to reread and relearn my own code, and that was wasting time, and I, I just wanted an answer to a simple question, so. That's what I've decided to do. If I override it, it's damn well overridden, and I structure it so that they call change the things. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not. We're, that kind of complexity, yeah. Classic problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I use inheritance cautiously, but I do use it. Some bad code. Um, it's inconsistent. Look, it's got public show method, it's got a public hide method, then it's got a public show fail method. So what's it showing when you call show? Is it sh showing everything? What's it hiding? Is it hiding everything? Is it, uh, and then it keeps going. Maybe you should have had some comments. Yeah, well, that's right. Maybe you should have had comments. And oh, it's got this update. Where's the line? I can't even read it here. It's too small. Oh, that's just copy and pasting onto. I'm sure it is. It's not. It, I don't have 16 width tabs. That, that would be insane. You, you just go buy a bigger monitor, man. Of course. Yeah, that's why you. That's that's why you have big monitors so you can fit the huge tabs. 
Um, now, I'm not very good at using PowerPoint, so I wanted to put code in that I could scroll and whatnot. I did know how to do it. Uh, my favorite here is what? Var new scale equals what? Time pool divided time per level rating times bracket shadow scale minus shadow start scale bracket bracket plus shadow start scale. What the fuck does that do? I don't know. I wrote this two days ago. <laughs> I'm still adding to this. I don't, he got a bit out of hand. This is the downside when I said just code. It's, <laughs> so my favorite bit of code and my least favorite bit of code was coded almost at the same time. Almost at the same time. Uh, this is the very, I'm just trying to summarize me, my in code form. At my best, it's really, really simple. It approaches problems a bit differently and it utilizes what's already there to create a lot of power out of very little work. That's my code at its best. At its best, it almost looks like I'm being lazy. At its worst, it's long-winded, it contradicts itself, it's difficult to understand, breaks at unexpected times, and is generally difficult to work with. Who's worked with me? I didn't have a conclusion when I was writing this talk until I got to this point and I realized I did have a conclusion, I did have a point, I did have a reason to be here. Because it was at this point when I was describing my code at its best and its worst, I wasn't just describing my code at my best and its worst. I was describing me. For the people who have worked with me, that's me at my best. Um, that's uh, when our team was doing amazing looking art and hitting its milestones and whatnot, we weren't working overtime. And to anyone walking past the floor, we looked kind of lazy. We were smart, we were innovative. At my worst, I am long-winded. I do contradict myself, I am hard to understand, I do break down at unexpected times and I am generally difficult to work with. Uh, I'm sorry for all the people who have had to work with me when I'm at my worst. Um, and, and, and this is my conclusion. That code is as personal and a valid means of self-expression as any form of art. And that all you people are artists. Your medium is not easily understood by people, but it is understood by other coders. Coders will see you in your code. You're in there. And if you're all artists, then all of a sudden, I am qualified to give you advice. Oh. <laughs> Are you going to end on that note or what? Well, pretty much I end on that note. Look, the, the thing is, it, it is intimate and it is personal and all your qualities are in your code. If you are arrogant, if you are humble, if you're confident, if you're nervous, it will be in there in code. If you dither, it will be there in your code. Every element of your personality will be in your creation, just like you are an artist, just like you're an animator, just like you're a concept artist, just like you're building levels. And so you all know uh, to be a better coder, you've got to read about code and do a lot of coding and blah, 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 blah. But I would also say to be a better coder, you're going to have to step away from the computer and prove your, improve yourself as well, which I'm sure everyone here is doing. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you learn to be a better parent or a better son or a better daughter, or I, I think if you challenge yourself and learn snowboarding, I think if you just learn to be uh, nicer, more focused, if you just generally do all the being better people stuff, your code will get better too. And uh, that's my advice to you as an art director. And I wish you all the best of luck with that. Thank you very much for having me. What? Oh, questions, yeah, go, go for it. Can I drink some water? Which is my water? I've lost my water. Thank you. How long was that? Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, you're obviously an artist to begin with and an art director yeah. and an animator. Um, how long would you say it would have taken you working full time uh, to go from 
an art director not having touched the code, maybe knowing the basic concepts of code, yeah. but not having touched it, to where you are now where you wouldn't call yourself a, a coder, but yeah. you feel comfortable making a game, even if it's a, you know, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not great, but um, probably about two years. Two years? I should put in a proviso, I didn't put it in my history, but I had a Commodore 64 mm -hmm. and I spent hours and hours and hours typing basic programs yeah. on a Commodore 64 and that was actually the first thing I ever did with a computer. So I, I entered into, I mean, obviously that's why I said object oriented, because the Commodore 64 yeah. basic wasn't object oriented. Uh, so I, I did know what code was. A lot of people don't even know what it was. So maybe having to cram that concept into your head would add even more time to it. But for me, yeah, I'd say about two years. Maybe more. Actually, I would say less if you were in a group because I was by myself, yeah. which was nuts. Yeah, it's any concept really. Yeah. If you're done by yourself. Actually, well, I wasn't by myself for the first like six months because I was still working and it was great and I think all the coders I was working with got sick of me because I was asking, uh, asking them stuff. Oh, oh, I have another great story. My talk's over, but can I rewind a bit? I've got, I've got a great story. Uh, Brendan, I mentioned him earlier, Ski Safari. Okay. Uh, I, I was playing Ski Safari. Has everyone played Ski Safari? Okay, it's an endless skier. So you ski along, along. It's 2D, and the, obviously the terrain's procedurally generated and whatnot. And I just wanted to know because it's got physics and whatnot. I wanted to know how he was dealing with getting too far away from zero zero because of floating point accuracy. Because I know about floating point accuracy because I'm all clever and experienced in the games industry. And when we let Ty, the Tasmanian tiger, fall into space for too long, his body used to fly to pieces. You see, see, we used to do, I don't know why, we just, we'd walk off the end of the world and then we'd just walk away from the controller and Ty would fall in space for about 20 minutes. Dissolve. And yeah, he'd eventually dissolve and we'd go, why is he dissolving? It's and some, it, some coder would say, floating point. <laughs> and so I learned about floating point because of that. Um, so I wanted to know what Brendan was doing. Was he actually, the skier was staying in the same spot and he was moving the world around him? Or was he letting him go so far and teleporting him back? You, and seamlessly though, tracking the velocities and everything. Okay, that, either one of those solutions sounded very tricky and I was very lucky to run into him at GCAP. Um, and I promptly asked him, that was pretty much the first thing I said to him, hey Brendan, I haven't seen you too late uh, for, for ages. Uh, tell me about how you did this in Ski Safari. He didn't do anything. He just keeps moving him in the X. He says, ah oh, yeah. The avalanche catches him before it's a problem. <laughs> so the moral to that is do the simple thing first because sometimes the simple thing will be enough. So yeah, I was blown away. I was, rank I was worried about that problem for six months. It wasn't even my problem, but I just wanted to know how he did it. <laughs> you excuse to dying in a game though, Yeah, yeah. The avalanche will catch you. He just keeps saying the avalanche will catch them. It's not lag, floating point kill me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>